Well, guys, it finally happened. The Fiend finally won the Universal title at Crown Jewel. Now, it's a, a month too late. It should have happened in Hell in a Cell, I know. But this was refreshing to see. Uh, finally, their golden boy, Seth Rollins, they finally, you know, had him drop the belt to Bray. And, you know, this is technically Bray's second reign. He was a WWE champion for a month, but that was like long forgotten. Way back in 2017, it's a forgotten match. It's a match that, you know, that people don't even remember. And also the match he had with Mania with Orton was... You know, not held in such high regard. Uh, but now the Fiend. The Obviously, I'll say this. There is a lot of people who like this character, including myself. Now, you know, I made a lot of, I don't mean to pat myself on the back, very accurate predictions about Bray Wyatt. I said that they weren't going to treat this character the right way. But once again, this was really damage control. They knew after Hell in the Cell that they, they pissed off the people that they're catering to. Not only that, but the more casual fans with a ridiculous finish, with a ridiculous event, Hell in the Cell. So this was their way of doing damage control. And they already know that no matter what type of fan you are, that no one likes Crown Jewel. Now, I saw a couple of people saying, you know, that they're doing a great thing for the Saudi children. And that may be true. But it, when you kind of take everything into the proper context, and we're going to talk about a few things on, these sh on this show. I think there's probably like one thing, and I'm not talking about the Fiend match. And though I'm not talking about Brock Lesnar and... Cain Velasquez. I'm talking about something else. So I don't want to spoil it by mentioning it right here at the beginning of the video. But we're going to get to it. And I, and I guarantee you won't be disappointed by my reaction. So let, let's just go through this. So Damage Control. We know that was the name of the game uh, on this um, particular event. So we started off with Brock Lesnar defeating Cain Velasquez. And I was actually really surprised that a lot of people thought that Velasquez was going to win. Even Russo actually thought that Velasquez was going to beat Lesnar. But that was not the case. Lesnar beats him in two minutes. Not only beats him, but beats him like in such an emphatic fashion. He gets him to tap out to the Kimura lock, which is a move he hasn't used in like three or four years. I don't even remember the last time I've see, seen him even lock that move on. Um, I think he might have used it against The Undertaker. Like, that was four years ago. So we haven't seen it since then. So to see that, and then you had to have like Rey Mysterio. Rey Mysterio. Uh, you know, a smaller guy. Uh, you know, that I'm a fan of, but like having to like be the one to rescue Velasquez like this was supposed to be you know Brock's big nemesis he was scared of him and everything you look at this match and you're like why was he scared why was this this guy got pummeled on the first episode of Smackdown on Fox right and then we fast forward a month and this guy you know Lesnar wiped the floor with him if you did not see their their fight in UFC, you would think that this guy was on par with the Brooklyn Brawler. You'd think he was on par with, uh, you know, just any other jobber on the roster. You know, I, I mean, really. Th this was like an embarrassment. And, so you know, some people will say it's, you know, it's cool. You know, we don't need to have a 20-minute match and everything. I wasn't expecting that anyway. But I, the funny thing about this is I didn't really talk about it a lot. I probably should have because now people are just going to, you know, they're not going to validate this opinion. But I was thinking in the back of my mind that they probably would do a squash. And see, that's the thing. They overdo this. You know, they, they did it with Goldberg surprising Brock with that win. And they did it with, you know, Brock on, like, okay, they just did something like this. 
Brock beating Kofi for the title in in nine seconds, right? And then they're going ahead and they're this one, okay, this was a little long, this was two minutes. But you see what I mean? The quick, fast, surprising finish. It's being overdone. And especially when this was like your bread and butter and you weren't even building it properly. The first time they brought him out, it was good. It was the end of the show. It was something hot to go off the air. Their first debut episode of SmackDown. You know, and then when the wheels started to fall off, you saw that this storyline didn't have a lot of steam and everything. It just, you know, they just had Mysterio get involved because, you know, Kane Velasquez couldn't talk. The guy didn't even say, he, he said like two words. He said to Brock, I'm going to put a scar on the other side of his face. And then Rey Mysterio pretty much did the talking from, you know, that point out. Uh, not like Kane really did a bad job. Velasquez didn't do a bad job, but it's really weird. I gotta say, saying Kane because every time I say Kane, I feel I have to like clarify I'm talking about Velasquez because you think I'm talking about the big red machine. But this is like I, I don't even know what to say. So you know, uh, Rey Mysterio hits Brock with the chair, um, you know, to get him off, and, and Brock ends up fleeing. Um, you know, okay, like, so Ray's got the chair, that's the equalizer, I get that, but man, I mean, like, there's no way that, um, and, and this is one of the few times I'll agree with Wade Keller, uh, there's no way that Velasquez could come back from this, like, like, he's done, he's finished, and I watched Smackdown already, because I, as I'm recording this, I did watch Smackdown, so I'm going to be doing that review, so you guys are going to have to hold off a little bit longer, because I needed to get this one out, um, and he wasn't on SmackDown, and now Brock is going to be leaving SmackDown for Raw, so now it's like Velasquez just has no way of, unless he's going to help Ray when, when Brock and Ray have their eventual, uh, match, but, like, his time to shine in WWE was just in one, one false swoop, just destroyed ended there, there's no opportunity here to have a return match because they they just told you we're not in the business of Kane Velasquez this guy doesn't mean anything to us this guy is you know was just a stepping stone that's probably what they wanted to do here really they did a really bad job of telling this story but if I had to guess I'd be like they want to make like Brock Lesnar now has no weaknesses the one Achilles heel that he had, he got rid of him. So let me get this straight when I'm thinking about this. Now, I know you're probably going to say because this is not the octagon. This is a wrestling ring. Uh, you know, this is a wrestling match. This is a pro wrestling match. This is a sports entertainment match, whatever you want to call it. It's just really funny to me that Finn Balor can take Brock Lesnar to a 10-minute match where he's like even dominating a good portion of it. Keep in mind that that guy is now in NXT of all places. And don't use the excuse that they put him over there to up the ratings. I don't want to hear that garbage. He never got over properly on the roster. Making him Universal Champion was a mistake. But whatever, that, that's getting off topic. Enough about Finn Balor's shortcomings and his accomplishments that should have never been. You booked Finn Balor to go in to the match with Lesnar uh, at the beginning of this year. And you had him dominate. And then you go ahead and you fast forward to the present day. And now we have this match in the record books where a legitimate guy, the probably the only guy who could take it to Lesnar and, and in a real fight probably beat him up. Because he really did beat him in a real fight. Because the UFC is real. The WWE is not. Obviously, I don't need to tell you that. But uh, their only opportunity, their only legit Achilles heel for Brock Lesnar has just been completely dismissed, completely disregarded as just a, another guy that Brock just steamrolled over. I, I, I don't know. I don't know how you make this stuff up. They really flew this guy over to Saudi Arabia for a two-minute match. To, like, 
How is, first of all, can I ask a question here? How is Cain Velasquez even agreeing to this? How is he actually saying, yeah, okay, but they must have been paying him a lot of money for this. And they probably cut him in on the Saudi deal. That means that this guy probably has no, you would think like if you're a fighter in the UFC, I know that most people probably fight for money, but I would think that there was a little bit of pride with it. I guess not. I, I really guess not because to really go over there, you know, and, and and do the job in two minutes, I mean, I guess it really must be all about money. Then we get a, a Vikings Raider promo. Okay, whatever. They're standing in the dark. Turn a light on for God's sakes. Okay, now we have the big tag turmoil match. And uh, it's really funny. I wrote the OCD, but it's just the OC. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's call them the OCD. So the OCD beats the Viking Raiders. First of all, okay, I understand that the Usos have a little, have been at some, you know, run-ins with the law as of late, you know, in real life. But, you know, I, as far as I know, the last thing that I heard from the dirt sheets was they just don't have anything for them, which is just pathetic. I mean, you, you, you've got something for the Viking Raiders, but you have nothing for the Usos who have proven themselves time and time again. You know, and they're not doing some goofy gimmick like pretending that they're Vikings in 2019, for God's sake. You know, anyway, um, the OC beats your tag champions after like defeating like two other teams. First of all, okay, there's no Usos. There's uh, no Hawkins and Ryder, which were the last tag champs, right? Or no, like they were the champs before. Whatever the order was, they were champs. They won the belts on the WrestleMania pre-show and held on to them for a while. And you're not you're not putting them in there? I, I don't get it. I think they were on the pre-show um, Rumble or something like that. The, or the Battle Royal, but, you know, they're not there. Anyway, the the Viking Raiders are, are defeated. Does the OC win the tag titles? No. They're, they're the greatest tag team in the world, but they don't have the tag belts. They win a, a trophy. Like, what does this trophy even mean? Why would they want this trophy? Wouldn't, you know, wouldn't they want the tag belts instead? No. In, instead, the Viking Raiders have the tag belt so that would still mean that they're the best they're the tag champs of the world so they're still considered the best right i guess i don't know usually champions lose anyway but you see my point i mean you you give them a lousy trophy meanwhile the team that they, they get the champions get pinned and they still keep the belts i get it yeah they were they, well brad they weren't on the line I, I get that you don't have to tell me that i get it but you know, if you're going to crown this team the greatest tag team in the world, yeah, they're the greatest tag team in the world. I'm sure a few people, I think most people that were Bullet Club crazy with their Bullet Club t-shirts, oh, so cool and everything, right? You know, I'm sure most of those people have outgrown the Bullet Club face because I don't hear about the Bullet Club anymore, do you? I know I sure don't. Um... Then you had Mansoor defeating Cesaro. And this guy, you know, I mean, I look at him and it's like, you know, the allure of him is, is based on, you know, his creed. He's a Middle Eastern guy, right? He's in Saudi. You know, he's, so, he's he, right? This guy's Saudi. He's the first ever Saudi wrestler. But I get that. It, you know, but this guy looks very similar to another Middle Eastern star, Ali. And he does the same moves. He, he's, he's the same high-flying guy. And they even have him dressed the same. He's got his facial hair is the same way. His hair is the same length. Now, I get it. They weren't an authentic guy. They're not the same nationality. I get it. But they, these guys look the same way. It's not a matter of that. It's just showing that everyone not only wrestles the same, but now it's even getting to the point where guys even look the same. It's ridiculous. I, I mean, and this guy, the only reason he wins. So last time they were in Saudi Arabia for um, 
what were they? What was it? Super Sh uh, Showdown was the last one, and they had Mansoor win the um the battle royal. Yeah, so they you know so he hasn't been seen since, and now he's back again to beat Cesaro. And like, by the way, what's up with Cesaro? I didn't even say this during SmackDown, but this guy like. What's up with he's wrestling in sneakers and jeans? What happened to his tights? Now he's 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 dressed like even worse than Dean Ambrose was, John Moxley, right? Like this guy has no outfit. They, they he has no attire. It's just jeans. Like what like what is this? I mean, I don't get it. After you know, Sheamus got injured, it's almost like you know, bringing Sheamus back, if that means that, you know, Cesaro has to be wandering around like an aimless goof, doing nothing on the roster, he just has to eat, like, losses so they could put over this guy. And this is, like, a big moment. He he beats Cesaro, and look, hey, I get it. It's supposed to be a monumental moment. He won in front of his hometown. I get it. It's not every day that they come to Saudi Arabia. So it's not like when someone else wins in their hometown. But I'm saying it's not really that big of a deal. They're giving them their show and everything. They're putting on a big event. you know. And not only that, but we have to have superstars representing Saudi Arabia. And then they have to get big 10-minute celebrations. I haven't even seen people... I didn't even see, you know, Cringy Lynch celebrating that long at WrestleMania. I didn't even see Kofi Kingston get that much time. You know, they focused more on Mansoor winning a, a match against Cesaro. Like, like everyone's beating Cesaro. Great accomplishment. I, you know, I get it. And we're going to talk a little bit more about, like, overdoing it. You know, also a big interview here. Oh, my God. Like, it was like HBK at WrestleMania 12 after the Iron Man match. Oh, what a beautiful moment. It, it, yeah, real beautiful. I, I I mean, like, could anyone honestly, without, you know, trying to pretend to be a great person, say that they really, like, felt something emotional during this Mansoor victory? Because I'll tell you something, I didn't feel the thing. I was like, can this be over already? How long is this celebration going to go on for? Like, I'm telling you, like, like you know, how about everyone else watching this on the network? You know, okay, we, we get it. You, you, you know, we're bowing down to Saudi Arabia during this event. We're giving them everything you want because you're paying us billions of dollars. You know, this is such nonsense. And I'll tell you something. The, you know, the fact that Daniel Bryan didn't go to this show... I, I mean, and there's like a few others and, you know, and John Cena, like I'm a big fan out of all these guys. Anyone who did not go on the principle that I am i can't think of that refused. So I, I don't know like about the Miz or anything, but a few people stayed back. You know, the Miz went last year, so I guess not him. But anyway, whoever stood their ground. You know, I have to say, like, I'm a fan of that person. So, like, Daniel Bryan made the point that he doesn't want anything of that. Everyone else, it's like no self-respect. They're making a paycheck. You know, even the guys that already have big paychecks, they got to make even bigger paychecks by, by going over there. Okay, so anyway, you know, big moment here for Mansoor, even though the average everyday person is sitting there rolling their eyes, even if they don't want to admit it and they want to be a big phony and say, whoa, what a magical moment. Uh, what else we got here? Um, Seth Rollins cuts a promo backstage. Um, doesn't even sound like the Saudis really like him all that much. I think there was a mixture of booze in there. Then we learned that NXT is going to be at Survivor Series. Wait to the SmackDown review for my opinion on that, guys. I'm, I'm not, sorry, I'm not going to scratch that itch just yet. You'll know exactly what I think about it when you watch the SmackDown review. Tyson Fury defeated Braun Strowman by countout. You know, okay, I get it. We're protecting Braun by giving him a countdown victory. And then Michael Cole proclaims it's a TKO. No, it's not. 
It's a count out. That's the that's the decision you made there. You you know you can't even commit to Tyson Fury. Like Tyson Fury hits like six big boots. Braun doesn't know what to do, so he goes charging around. Does anybody like think to themselves like when Braun does that shoulder block at ringside, how ridiculous it looks? I mean, he's running around the whole thing. I, I get it to get momentum. But, like, he's a big guy. How much momentum is he getting? You got to run around the whole ring. It look, you know, every single, you know, we like to joke about when the 24 7 guys run around the ring. Braun Strowman does it every match, running around the ring like, like, like it's Ring Around the Rosie or something. I mean, you got to be kidding me. Like, and he does it twice. You, you know, talk about wearing it out. It wasn't even good to begin with. It's like, so, it's a move that I can't wait for it to be over. At least it ain't a tope suicida. I will say that. I'll, t I'll take a run around the ring instead of a tope. Well, I don't know. A tope suicida is over quicker, you know, than a, a run around the ring from Braun Strowman. But, like, I already said, like, this went on. Th there's no way that Braun should have even stood a chance. He's in there against a heavyweight boxer with no gloves on. It, it should it should be one punch. Don't even bother with big boots to the face. Punch to the face. He takes him 10 minutes to remember he's a boxer. See, I get it. It's a pro wrestling match. But that's why it's unbelievable and it shouldn't happen in the first place. And I get it. Tyson Fury's a big star. Well, do you see these ratings? Does it look like anyone's interested? The answer to that question is no, folks. So this was a waste of time. No one cared about it. And, you know, and not only that, but the match was ridiculous. And it ends in a count out. And now we'll probably never see Tyson Fury again. Thanks a lot for that. And, you know, Braun then hits a power slam. And, you know, Fury gets right back up after. I don't know. They might do a rematch or something. Who cares about this? First of all, Braun Strowman is a joke. You know, this guy right here, I mean, it's not his fault. I mean, you know, it shows up late. I, I said time and time again, find the guy, release him, do whatever you, you're you going to do. But stop with this herky-jerky thing. We, we, we get it. He, he He's not going to have a prominent spot at WrestleMania. You, you've done this to ha him how many times in a row, right? The three WrestleManias in a row, right? That, that he's been made, uh, he's been on uh, two pre-shows. And, uh, and then you've also had him uh, tag teaming with a child. Uh, you know, gr great track record. So, you know, th this guy is just looking like a million bucks as of late. Um, and then you, you put him in this prone position with a boxer that, that punches him and knocks him out cold, like right on TV. And, and, you know, not only that, but the fact that Braun's even getting up for that. I get he flips over trucks and stuff, but this is just moronic. Just stop. You know, like, come on already. First of all, the allure of Lesnar dried up long ago. We, you know, so, I mean, not Lesnar, of Braun dried up long ago. So it is time to just, you know, I don't know, cast Braun out. Do what you got to do because I'm sick and tired of seeing this guy go up and down and up and down. He's strong. He's weak. He's in between. He's a joke. He's, he's a serious threat. Whatever. Whatever. The monster among men. This guy is is not scaring anybody. Um, the sings uh, pin our truth backstage. He, you know, uh, truth uh, makes like he's gonna do a getaway, and then he rams into a door, and then he ends up getting pinned. Um, so you know, there was a battle royal on the pre-show, which. Um, uh, R Truth ended up winning the title back from the Singh brothers. Um, they've done this before. They did that at the football field with Kane, you know, uh, back, what was it, on the Raw reunion show where he, like, rammed into the, um, you know, in, into the goalpost. I mean, you know, so it, it's like they're going to keep reusing these same spots. I don't know, whatever. It's a small little thing. AJ Styles defeated um, Umberto Carrillo and... Okay, guys, like, first of all, this guy right here, he's a good athlete. Um, you know, Umberto is, you know, he's good and everything, but we have so many of these guys already on the roster. Do we really need another? 
Do we honestly need another one of these luchador high-flying guys? Because whether or not you are a luchador and Mexican wrestler, you know, or wrestle the lucha style, there's a thousand one... A thousand and one guys like this in NXT. A thousand and one guys like this on the main roster. We don't need another person doing, you know, all these high-flying springboard, you know, tope maneuvers. I, I, I mean, I am sick to death of this style. I remember when it used to be fresh and exciting. It's stale and boring. And it's overused. It's overdone. And the fact that people still pop for this style is a bit alarming. Really, guys, like, first of all, half of these dives, I'm not talking about Umberto, but I'm saying in general, don't even look that impressive. The only one who does a suicide dive worth a damn on this roster is Daniel Bryan, because it actually looks like there's some energy and, and some force behind that push at the end of the move. Aside from that, there's nothing there. So anyway, this is another guy. AJ um, taps him out. Okay, great. So, you know, like, he's already now lost to AJ twice. Um, who else did he lose to? Um, a Seth Rollins. Okay, so three losses for this guy. So now, like, why am I even going to care? Okay, he, he, won the, he won that Battle Royal earlier in the night. So he won one match. He won a Battle Royal. But he has yet to pin anybody. Or make them submit. So it's like, this guy... Now, he, he blew another opportunity here. So, he looks like a loser. So, why should I care? He's athletic. So, are a lot of other guys. Doesn't mean that they're good. You know, that doesn't mean they're entertaining. Uh, we've got Hogan backstage. This was a nice little classic promo from Hogan. It, you know, uh, we haven't seen a lot of Hogan. You know, his return is still fresh and it's much welcomed amongst all the other boring promos. I mean, you compare this to Seth Rollins' promo. And you hear this and then you hear this. And you obviously know which one I prefer. And um, I actually, um, uh, well, we're going to talk about that in a second. Let's move on to the other thing that I was going to discuss before, but I held back on it during the Mansoor uh, Cesaro uh, match review. And that's Natalia defeating Lacey Evans. Now, to the untrained eye, you know, you, you, or if, if you don't know what's going on here and you don't know about, you know, cultures and world events, uh, you know, women are not that popular in, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, you know, they, they kind of have to keep covered up and stuff. Now, there's some weird things. Then I'm going to talk about here in a few little details because I, I was keeping my eyes glued to the screen there. And, um, you know, this is not the first time that women wrestled in the Middle East. There was Alexa Bliss, and I think she wrestled, um, who did she, I forget who she wrestled, but Alexa Bliss was involved, but that was like in the Middle East, and it was like considered to be a thing, but... This was the first time that it was going to happen in Saudi Arabia, where women have to be covered up. And um, these girls come out, and they are completely fully clothed, long sleeves, long pants down to the ankles, t-shirts on top of the long sleeved outfits. Probably a little extra long just to make sure it covers the buttocks, right? Wow. <laughs> like, you've got two attractive ladies here. Natalia, Lacey Evans, good looking girls, right? Good looking bodies, right? But we're in Saudi Arabia. And we've got to honor the cultures, as Stephanie McMahon says. So... Like, first of all, if this is even a thing, remember, we're about women empowerment. And I, I get it. We are empowering women around the world now. Not just in the U.S., but we got to do it even in cultures where this empowerment is not even welcomed. You, 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 you've got the Saudi king here and you've got a bunch of others and they're probably laughing it up because they, they see, 
you know, WWE, the wrestling company, the professional wrestling company, the sports entertainment company, you know, we've got Vince McMahon talking about, you know, being a genetic jackhammer. And, and, and now he thinks that his company is, you know, going to be like this world renowned, respected global brand of entertainment that changes lives. What a joke. I mean, honestly, like this was sad. You're going to put these girls out there and not only that, but the girls are playing into it. They're, they, they, they honestly were getting emotional. They were crying at the end of this match. Natalia taps out Lacey. Who cares who the match? What great maneuvers. They are. Like, you know, honestly, was anyone really paying attention to the wrestling? I was just couldn't get past the outfits and how comical it was. And not only that, but like, I'm also looking in the crowd. There's a young girl wearing a tank top. A little girl. Uh, so, like, okay, that that's allowed even for a little girl, but, like, these girls have to, fully grown women have to be dressed. Like, first of all, if they were really, like, you know, a feminist, like, real feminist that actually cared about, like, you know, how women felt and how they're perceived in media and in real life and otherwise, they'd stay the hell home. Because they'd be like, I'm not going to a place that suppresses women, that makes women look bad, that makes women feel ashamed of their bodies. What? Why are they going to go to a place that's setting them back hundreds of years? Like, does anyone know how ridiculous this sounds? They were allowed to wrestle in front of men and women. Like, who cares? But this is an honor to wrestle. Like, this is. This is a, a cultural, like, inspiration. Like, I can't believe people are actually buying into this. I, I, I'm looking, you know, by the way, I talked about it in my AEW Dynamite review, a great Instagram page, Burying the Smarks, a guy that helped promote me that I became friends with. So, you know, go follow him on Instagram. But I'm seeing other people on the page, and they're like, they're talking about, like, Saudi Arabia and, like, what a wonderful thing this is. And I'm like, this is not a wonderful thing at all. This is suppression. This is ridiculous. These girls are like dressed, you know, down to their ankles, up to their wrists, up to their necks and clothing. When it's like, you know, these girls are supposed to represent female empowerment. This is the women's evolution. There was nothing evolving here. It was degrading. It was um, a, a de-evolution. It was going backwards. I mean, pr pretty much the women were almost the, the primordial ooze at this point because they were just, you know, put in a position here to look foolish. It, you know, like they, like almost like they were being laughed at because you know they're they're crying and everything, getting all emotional. You know, very stereotypical there for the female. You know, just there was. There was nothing right about this. I thought that this was completely wrong. This was just horrible that people were buying into this. And they're doing different shots of women that are all covered up. Oh, this is so inspiring. I hope I could be a wrestler. And, you know, like, when I grow up, like, oh my God, come on. And people are saying they're doing a great thing for the children. You, you know, by showing that you're going to, like, you know, kowtow to like a bunch of people that have a very suppressive way of life that's not fair to other people that violates basic human rights human rights that most places on this planet have had for hundreds of years you know i mean my god that we're talking about a culture that just recently allowed women to drive and to get jobs oh my oh it's progress right that's what someone's saying progress progress for what to wrestle in front of a crowd like, geez, oh, Lou, you gotta be kidding me if this, like, excites you or makes you feel empowered. You need to really think other aspects of your life if something like this has a, a meaningful inspiration to you. Come on. Like, honestly, like, get with the program. Get with reality. Get a, a reality check. I mean, honestly. Um, I enjoyed the Hogan, uh, Team Hogan, Team Flair match. Because 
the baby faces basically got beaten down. They they went they did a nice little formulaic tag match here, and I was talking about it, you know, about the Rock and Roll Ex Express, you know, on my Dynamite review, and how much I missed that style. We got that style here, so I really like that. You know, there were some spots, but they were interwoven very nicely. And I'm looking at the teams here. You know, just think about this. You've got Roman Reigns, and he's teaming with Ali, Shorty G, Ricochet, and Rusev. So, 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 not only do we have three guys that are, you know, tiny dudes that all they do is spot, 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 um, and, and, and Rusev the cuck, right? You know, so this guy's a joke anyway. And how about that? The victory thing at the end there. He's like, uh, like in between, like what a, what a. A joke what, what you know like my god like oh god rusev man what's you know i, I and I, I found out recently this guy has not resigned so you know it's like whatever to him that's probably why we're getting this garbage storyline and you no know, i get it like it's the most like over thing probably in wwe right now besides the fiend because it was the most viewed thing on youtube i'm not denying that but like you know, th this is why I, I said, like, it's uncomforting because it's like the storyline really is something extremely cringy. And then you've got Brazers, like, tweeting The Fiend, like, on Twitter. And I'm like, holy cannoli. I, 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 like, this is just creepy stuff, man. That's creeper than The Fiend. Like, I, that, it, that, that industry... That is actually contacting WWE stars. And, and then you wonder why we see a storyline of that style. But anyway, let's get back to the match. Enough about that. So we'll talk about that when we talk about Raw whatever. So, it, it was good. Um, but I mean, like, Roman Reigns' team. And um, and then you look at, at, at the, uh, the other team. And you've got Drew McIntyre. You've got Baron Corbin. Naka Murphy, whatever, um, Randy Orton, and uh, who else was there? Um, somebody else um, that I like. I, I can't remember at the moment, but um, you know, these were all good, like credible stars that actually look. Oh, and Lashley, Lashley was there, and uh, you know, of course, Lana's not out there because. You know, where are we, right? We just talked about that. Anyway, it, you know, so we've got a bunch of really talent, like way more imposing guys. But of course, that team loses. And surprisingly enough, Randy Orton ate the pin here from Roman Reigns, which was just like, so all these other guys and, and Orton is the one to lose here. I mean, wow, uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know what to say to that. Wade Keller says that he thinks it's because Randy did the little AEWTs on social media. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, they're they're petty as hell. It, you know, um, like, uh, Randy shouldn't really be doing stuff like that. I mean, you know, it, just to be quite honest, like I'm saying, if, if you work for a company... And, and, and you start, like, doing stuff like that. Like, wh what do you think, especially with a company like this, what do you think that they're going to do to you? You already see how they've treated everyone else. Do you really think that they're just going to, like, you know, let that one go? I mean, look what they're doing to Rusev, for, for God's sakes. Anyway, let, let's move on to the main event. And it was The Fiend defeating Seth Rollins. Now, I enjoyed this match. You know, Seth gets pushed off He's through um, stack tables. Uh, they did another barricade spot. That's been done a thousand times, whatever. Um, but, it, you know, I, I liked the match. It was good. Um, e even the other stuff, be, you know, like the actual context of the match was better than the Hell in the Cell. Probably like at almost every single interval of it. The only thing that like they should have learned their lesson from is when they go up on the stage, Seth Rollins hits the stomp eight times. Like, 
excessive. Like, I mean, honestly, like, the, the finisher should be a sacred thing. But nowadays, we've talked about this on our Dynamite review, so go watch them if you want a more elaborate rant on this. But we've also talked about it numerous times in the WWE. It's an even bigger problem on Dynamite, but it's just as, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a problem in WWE as well. And this, is, this about proves it. I mean, how many times are you going to hit your finisher? You're not even pinning him after that. You know, even Michael Cole screamed that, and I've already pinned him. And like, you know, Corey Graves is like, oh, well, he's still moving. And I mean, yeah, that that's true. Uh, that's true. He is still moving, but there were a few times when he was down where he could have pinned him. Anyway, um, he gets dumped off the stage, the Fiend does. Um, a bunch of sparks, there's fire, you know, stagehands come. They do the fire extinguisher. Um, Seth goes near it. Sparks pop up. Seth says that he can't see. And um, and the fiend starts standing over him. And that was a great visual. He just stands on top of that equipment, glaring down at him. Grabs him in the mandible claw. Sister Abigail. I'm kind of surprised they haven't changed the, the name of that move. Like, that's very, like, you know... The old gimmick for Bray Wyatt. You would think they would have named it something else. You know, something uh, like, um, like, um, I, I don't know, something with the hurt and heel thing. Something. Uh, you would think that they would have done that. But anyway, um, The Fiend is the Universal Champion. And there's your show, guys. Uh, so overall, what did I think about it? It, it you know, I, I really like the you know um, the fiend winning here. It also wasn't a bad matchup until the stomps. I really did legitimately like the Hogan Flair tag match. I thought it had a more old school feel with it. I guess I don't know. I guess Roman Reigns kind of held it together a little bit more um, since he was the team captain here. But everything else was like pretty damn cringy. I have to say the Mon Sword thing went on. A worthless tag team um, turmoil match that didn't even result in anyone winning the tag titles. The team that won didn't even win the tag titles, and yet they're considered to be the greatest tag team in the world. I don't care about AJ versus Umberto. Uh, Natalia and Lacey was an embarrassment. Brock Lesnar and Velasquez was just like no surprise there, but you know, come on, guys. Like, Flying this guy all the way over there to Saudi Arabia to lose in two minutes. I mean, is that that's really what we're doing here? I mean, like, oh, I, so overall, we we could say that if there's one thing we're gonna take away from this, it's the Fiend winning the title. If he didn't win at the end, this show would be forgotten in the bowels of WWE, you know, pay-per-views, like, you know, international pay-per-views are, you know, forgotten as they are. You know you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, even rebellions and insurrections, like, no one even really, like, they've had some good shows, but, like, those are shows that no one even really talks about. That they weren't popular because they didn't air in the U.S., um, so it's like, you know, it, well, this one did. So, you know, but if that did not, um, if that did not happen at the end, I would not even be even remotely talking about this from a more positive standpoint. There was, you know, there definitely was unbearable moments on this show. There were things like why I didn't want to review the show last year, because there's just... So many things on it to dislike, like watching the women wrestle fully, you know, clothed. And it's it's not even like, you know, that they're not in revealing outfits. It's the fact that they had them dress from head to toe based on a, you know, a, a cultural discrepancy. It, you know, it, it shouldn't be. I mean, if they, you know, remember when WWE used to be about freedom of expression, attitude, you know, just, you know, be yourselves, characters, letting loose, you know, as WWE, even Michael Cole would say, it's all about having a good time, right? So, 
you know, they're crying. It's just, ah, oh, I don't know. Once again, I feel very uncomfortable. You know, and I'm not saying that, like, as an SJW. I think you guys know more than anybody else here on YouTube. I am not one because, you know, you know the perspective that I stand on. But um, I got to say, like, this stuff, that, like, I laughed. I, I laughed. I found it comical, but it did bother me. I'm like, wow, those poor girls. But, I mean, like, they agree to it. So, I mean, you got to really also blame them, too. But they want to make money. You know, did they really sign up for this? You know, I, I, you understand, like, that if they, you know, don't want to go to Saudi Arabia, it will be held against them, right? So, um, you, you got you got to believe that they probably kept that in mind. That's probably why they did it. But, man, oh, man, that was an embarrassment especially, especially for a company. And I know that people have different perspectives. They're going to view it as something great for feminism, something great for female empowerment. But I am sitting here and telling you that it was not. And if you look at this with a truly open mind, you will see that that narrative is completely false. And guys, I hope you all enjoyed the review. Please subscribe if you haven't already. Click the bell so you get all notifications when I post all my new videos. And guys, I'll see you next time.